Thank you. Thank you so much. Here we go. So as Ellen said, we've run this program for a number of years now, about 40 to be precise. Um, and in that time, the program has changed and pivoted with what we um, learned our scholars needed, what our industry needed, and what our organization could provide. So the most recent pivot in our history has been brought on in part by COVID and in part by the changes that we've seen in our environment, the pressures that climate change is putting on our um, decisions and our, the way we operate in our industries and also in what we hear from our scholars that is important to them. So we have rebranded the scholarship our focus to include sustainability learning and opportunity to explore sustainability on a global scale in our program itself. So the program as we deliver it now as Global Footprint Scholarship has three components. I'm just gonna share with you my screen, please um, let me know if you can't see this. Um, we have three workshops that we run with our scholars before they go travel. So everyone who has received a scholarship comes together on three occasions. We do it digitally so that everybody can participate from all over Australia. And we offer in those workshops opportunities for personal development, for professional development, and especially for sustainability learning. We showcase some um, projects that are done all over the world. We invite past scholars to share their experiences and their learnings. And um, that's where our scholars also form a cohort, get to work, get, get to know each other and work with each other and hopefully start a lifelong network of like-minded people. And these workshops run interdisciplinary, so it's not specific to horticulture, agriculture or trades. We run them all together and one of the most exciting learnings from those workshops is how people cross-pollinate ideas and I really love that, that part in particular about those workshops. At the same time we start coaching and mentoring scholars individually so we offer a pool of mentors from different industries and also from HR, from whatever skills and experience we believe might be useful for our scholars from what we've learned from them. And the scholars have the option to tap into this pool of mentors with specific questions that they may have. Then um, Swellen, our CEO, uh, taps into her skills and experience on coaching and mentoring to offer individual development opportunities for the scholars. So those, that's one-on-one -on -one coaching. At, um, at the end of the workshop period, people start to travel and our scholars have the opportunity to travel anywhere in the world that they feel will help them advance their knowledge, skills and understanding mm. of their profession. So we know that what we are good at is Giving, providing opportunities, but we are not experts in agriculture, for example. So we don't tell people where they should go. Our scholars come to us and say, this is what I want to learn and this is where I want to go. So we open the opportunity up for them and we hope that our scholars will come to us with some idea of what they want to do. Some research that they've done about where exciting things happen on our planet um, to go and explore for themselves. So they put their ideas forward, it goes into a scholarship plan that Sam will then look at and help people nut out where they want to go and how they want to do this. They will then receive funds to go and implement the scholarship journey. They'll travel overseas, they might go once, they might go twice, depending on how they can stretch their funds and pursue their goals in their travels with work placement. Sometimes people will go to conferences, sometimes they go into really hands-on work. It really depends on where the learning needs are and where the opportunities arise for our scholars. When they come back, we put them all back together in workshops to discuss their learnings and to pick back up where they left in their discussions as a cohort around their ideas, their journeys, their development and sustainability. And that then concludes the 
scholarship program, but hopefully it doesn't, it's not where these relationships stop and where the conversa conversation stops. We're very keen for our alumni to stay in touch with each other and with us. And it's often those alumni who bring back the most inspiring stories to the new cohorts of scholars. So do we have any questions on this part? Yes, Alan. So is there a time period for going away overseas? So uh, if I know that from uh, our own people coming through that uh, I think Ash Walker has gone back again to uh, England as, and he worked at the uh, Eden Project for the second time and but now he's at the Monet Gardens in Paris. So, but this is his second time, but I, I don't think he's under the scholarship for the second time, so I've never asked him that. But, uh, but is there a time period in uh, which to achieve this uh, working uh, program overseas? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just show you the, the, with you the next piece, which is exactly around the timelines. But to cap that off first, people usually go for about two months. We say that we would like people to gain with their scholarship funds 20 days of international work experience. How they slice that is up to them. Um, but we want a minimum of 20 days. Some people have gone for six months. Some people have gone for just four weeks. And it really depends on how they use their funds, whether they want to contribute their own. And in Ash's case, that was, that was what he did. And the second time he went, um, that was entirely his own um, organization and funding. So let me share with you what the, the usual, time. can I just add to that, the usual program is, and Carmen will show you, like by, by the end of the next year is when people must have left the country. However, mm -hmm. with someone like Ash and, and Tyler as well, Alan, there, were, there, there was some extension given because of COVID. So people couldn't actually travel when they originally got their scholarships. Okay. And that yeah. that's quite, might have seemed like a longer time as well for some people. But Carmen will take us through the timeline that is the program. Okay, can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is our scholarship program. So you'll see it's roughly 18 months. When scholars receive their scholarship, that is usually, usually awarded in the third quarter of the calendar year. Um, we sometimes shift with our opening dates and closing dates according to um, TAFE holidays and public holidays and Easter. So we usually open the program in autumn and we announce the successful scholars in spring. So by October, December, we will have completed, uh, during October and December, we'll have completed our three workshops, which are the personal and professional development and sustainability workshops. In those workshops, the scholars also get hands-on tips on how to organize their travel and their placements and all those things around the logistics of the scholarship. The mentoring kicks off about a month after the workshops, and that'll be again, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the scholar and the mentor or the scholar and the coach. You, we ask scholars when they sign their agreement with us that they do leave Australia for their scholarship by December the following year. So if they apply this year, we asked them to start their overseas journey by December 2024. They can leave as early as November this year and sometimes in agriculture where seasonal work is particularly pressing depending on the hemisphere they go, um, they can leave as early as November that year that they get awarded. And we've had that in this year with a young scholar in, um, in the dairy industry. So he went in November and then he's going again in June, I think. I might be wrong there, so <laughs> but he's going twice. So they leave before the end of the following year. So that's when they need to depart. And when they come back, we do have two more workshops with them where we bring back all the learning and have a presentation from, from each scholar about what they learn. So at the moment, it says on my slide here, July, August, we might bring it forward a little bit so that they can share their learnings with people interested in applying during the next year cycle so that they can see what others have done. So that is roughly the time 
frame of the program and we very much hope that at the end of it by the time they've completed it they become the mentors of the next cohort so hopefully it becomes a cycle rather than a one-way timeline but there's no there is no obligation to do so there's always a very strong invitation and we would love everybody to stay on but many people will move on in their careers and go from success to success and may not immediately have time and that is perfectly fine so that is what our timeline roughly looks like any questions um i've got a question carmen um yeah. uh, with the final um networking does that take into account that um scholars may not be coming back at the same time so does that get delayed or does the networking happen independently for each person then there's two types of networking there is the networking with their cohort and the mentors and then of course there's networking that happens overseas and then there's networking with the future cohorts so what we usually aim for is that scholars who leave in December come back by June the following year because simply because of the financial year that we have dispersed all the funds that they are entitled to and that they have completed their scholarship in that time. Usually they get their lump sum at the beginning to enable them to do all the travel and the work placements and we retain $500 towards the end. Um, until they've completed their presentation and shared all their learning with everybody else. And for that to occur, we like it all to be completed by June. So there is, if they leave it to the last minute to leave the country on their scholarship, this year's intake will be leaving on the 31st of December, 2024. And we'd want them to have brought back their report by the 30th of June in 2025. So there is a very long time window already, <laughs> but we yeah. really do hope that we've wrapped it up by then. <laughs> so okay. And the yeah. networking, Nathan, I mean, I know it's written there at either end of that, that line, but it is actually something that we're promoting the whole way through the program. So it's networking with everybody internationally and, you know, within Australia, within the cohorts, external to the cohorts. It's about networking and building relationship across everyone that you meet. Yep. Right. Very clear. Yes. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Well, we. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, yes quick one. I'm not. I'm not uh, young enough to go and eat one of these. Um, but if uh, someone was planning to go overseas for two years in their whole, uh, you know, overseas trips and everything else, so they would, in, and they achieve this scholarship, so they would have to break their overseas trip and come back after six months to do the, uh, the the workshops and mentoring, and then go back again overseas if they wanted to. Is that is that how is that how I'm reading it? No, no, no. All of our workshops are done remotely. Oh right now. Oh okay. Just, just like this one, everything is facilitated um, digitally and we provide our scholars with um, coaching and training around how to best set themselves up gotcha. in terms of digital networking and um, you know, using the tools that we have all available in abundance since COVID. Um, so we, we do set everyone up to, do, to participate in their best capacity from wherever they are. And the other question I would have is that all right, so you're going to give them a lump sum of $8,000. So during the course of that process, they would have to send you the receipts of how they've spent that $8,000? So they don't just get it up front like that. So so they, they provide a plan and that plan, well, Sam will talk about this in detail a little later on, but the, the plan actually specifies what money they need and when. And sometimes some of the scholars will actually pay for things and then provide the receipts and we, we reimburse it. Um, and other other ones um, will give the money when we know they're going to purchase um, flights, for example, or they need it for a specific reason. But it's all tied to the plan, which comes through to us and then we approve. Otherwise, you know, if we just give people a lump sum at the start awesome. of it. Yeah. 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 You know, so there's, a way, there's ways of managing it to make, to make sure that it goes to best use. Good. Yeah. yeah. 
Can I, um, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but can I ask to if we could possibly talk about um, how the applications are assessed? I've just got to go back to work shortly. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to watch the recording later um, if it's if it's not in no. time with the presentation. Well, how about we talk about how applications are assessed so that we can address that that need and, and then we can have a short break after that because we want to do a little survey as well to see how people have um, heard about the, the scholarship program and how you would recommend it. So we want to run that as well. But do you want to, do you want to cover off how it's assessed now? Is everyone okay if we do that? Sure. Okay. okay. All right. So... Carmen, are you covering that or is Sam? Sam, do you want to cover how it's assessed or would you like me to start going on to talk about that? Hi. Um, I think I didn't know I was talking about that. But anyway. That's all right. Um, oh, that's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll start off and I can jump in. I'll, I'll, yeah, okay. I wasn't sure whether you were covering that in your in your section. That's all right. So, so um, Sam will talk about like the, and Carmen will talk about the questions that are asked as part of the application process. But assuming we've covered all of that piece and people have put in their applications, what then happens is um, hopefully we have a whole lot of applications sitting there and people will, will have either answered it in writing or they will have um, provided a short video answering those, those five questions. Uh, in the meantime, we have gathered what we call our assessment panels. So across agriculture, horticulture and trades, we try to bring together people who are um, experts in those fields or you know, key people within those industries uh, that can provide us some feedback. So what we do then is we, we get the applications and we de-identify them so that we are not giving assessors um, you know, pictures of people and, and more information about those people other than their responses to those questions. And the reason that we do that is that we all are human beings and we all have a lot of unconscious bias that sits alongside of us all the time. And so we want to make sure that people are getting a fair a fair um, assessment of their application so we provide those applications to the assessment team they don't do it as a team they do it as individuals so no one's impacted or influenced by any other um, assessor in that group they then provide their feedback um, to us and that assessment is really looking at three uh, key things it looks at their um, passion around sustainability, their interest in sustainability. So but that's what we're looking for with these answers is uh, how interested and passionate are you about sustainability? How do you look at that across your industry? What do you want to learn about that? How engaged are you with that? And what opportunities can you see within your industry or in your jobs um, to apply the learning that you gain back, at, back in your roles and to share that. So it really is around passion, around sustainability. We don't expect people to have a whole lot of knowledge and experience in that, in that space, but we do expect people to be interested in it. Um, the second area that we look at is around um, demonstrated leadership, um, personal leadership experience um, and leadership potential. So you would have heard me say that our, our purpose is, is to support young people to become practical, impactful leaders. And so we want to look at, you know, where you're at with that. How interested are you in that leadership area? How much evidence do you have to demonstrate your leadership potential within your industry, within your, your sphere of the world? Um, so there's that aspect um, as well. And then the, the last part is, is really around your passion and engagement and your pride in your industry. So what connection do you have to your industry? What um, learning can, do you want to gain that will benefit the industry? Um, how passionate are you about what you do? And so we ask you questions like what, what's something that you are passionate about in your that you've done at work? Um, because we're, we're not necessarily looking for people who get the, you know, that they're the best in every single subject they've ever studied. They get the top marks and everything. We're interested in people who are practical, hands-on doers, who love what they do and want to make a real difference in the world. So those are the three sort of areas that we look at. And those things are aligned to our vision, values um, and our purpose. And so um, if the assessors come back and they, they rank those, they rank the applicants, and if it, it does link into how much money we have to be able to uh, give scholarships as well. So if we've got, um, you know, enough money to award those people scholarships, that's what we then uh, do. Now, there's also the option for an interview to take place. So if there's 
any uh, reason why we would think, okay, well, we've got too many applicants that in terms of the number of scholarships that we can award, we'll need to go the next, the next step and interview these people. There's the option for that to happen um, as well. And again, we would do that via, via Zoom. People wouldn't have to travel um, to have a face-to-face -face interview. Um, and that's another, another part of the process. So after we've completed all of that, then the decision rests with us at BBM to decide who we then um, award the scholarships to across those, those three um, groups, agriculture, horticulture and, and trades. Does that answer the question, Nathan? Is there anything else, anything specific that you wanted to know about that? Um, how many scholars uh, roughly or in the past, how many scholars have been selected in each group to go overseas and represent uh, global footprint? Okay, so well, we stopped during COVID, so that was that was a bit that was a bit mixed up those those few years. We had scholars who couldn't travel previously, and then yeah. you know, we got to travel, and some opted out as well. So it was that that's a bit of a um, like it's it's not accurate to just use those sort of figures. So we reopened the scholarship program um, last year and we awarded 13 scholarships and we had five in agriculture, five in trades and three in horticulture. This year we're opening up again and we would like to be able to give 15 scholarships this year. Um, and the idea would be that it would be roughly spread it out, you know, equally across those, those three areas, but it will depend on what um, applications we we get. And if you know if you know any people out there who are generous donors and would like to give us lots more money, um, we would be able to increase the number of scholarships that we that we offer. <laughs> <laughs> are there no, any? That's other, very good. Is that good? Okay. Any yeah, other questions? I will. I will maybe add to that that we hope to award scholarships in every category. But sometimes we have a lot of scholars in one and not very many in another. So I'm possibly addressing, especially the two people in the room who may be interested in applying. When we say 15 scholarships are available, don't assume automatically that you may not be in with a chance. You may well be in with a very good chance. <laughs> Depending on the year and how applications fluctuate, I very much encourage you to have a go, put in an application because, yeah, don't assume that there'll be, you know, so many applications that you won't stand out. It really depends on how the year goes. And um, yes, please do apply. Don't be discouraged when you say 15 for all of Australia. In your category, that may be well and truly enough to really stand out with, with your application. So have a go. Can I just ask that in the past, um, when you get the applications coming in, is there uh, any preference to kind of more that, you know, like in agriculture or horticulture or the trade? Is, where does the, uh, is it usually across the board pretty well equal or is there more preferences in agriculture, for example? Uh, well, to be honest, I can't say because I haven't been there for I haven't been there to see all of that except for the last year. And last and the last year was um, there were less applicants in horticulture. I have to okay. say in other areas, um, but that's not to say that was the case previously. I'm not sure, Carmen. Do you know about previous yeah, in, intake? I do know that 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 um, because we've changed the focus and it's um, it's there's no university qualified applicants, you know, as part of this process. I think in the past that people from university also could apply. So the numbers of people applying were probably more than what we've had when we reopened it again, I think that's fair to say. And that's part of this process is we want to get you know, many more people to know about this scholarship opportunity. And the fact that it is focused purely on the VET sector is something unique because other people don't, um, there's not this opportunity for people in the VET sector apart from this type of scholarship. Um, yeah, so we want to, we want to encourage as many people to apply as possible and to get the word out there. And the more we do that, then, hopefully the more we can uh, support the awarding of more scholarships as well. Yes, but there is no built-in bias in the program as to how many scholarships we award in the categories. So we mm -hmm. hope to be able to, you know, give 
awards to all the, the categories that we have. And um, yeah, so there's there's nothing predetermined that we say we do three of each or four of each. You know, we we really hope to give scholarships to excellent applicants. And some years we may not get enough people in one category, and then we can give the scholarships to those and others. And those three areas that I spoke about are the figures that we look for, um, you know, around the passion, engagement, the leadership and sustainability focus. Yeah. Other, other key things. Thanks so much, Sue Ellen, for explaining that. Um, Carmel and Sam. Oh, he just moved on my screen. You need to go now, Nathan. Well, well can we just do a quick um, survey? Have you got two minutes to do a quick survey before you run off, Nathan? Um, we might just do that now and Carmen's going to launch a, a survey for us um, and if you can just take a couple of minutes or Sam's going to do that sorry uh, launch the survey for us so that we can if you can just answer the couple of questions that are on there and then we'll come back and we'll talk further about eligibility and um, other parts of the program. The, the survey is a google doc in the chat can yeah. you see that all it's it's a link in the chat it's not a poll like the previous one there's a link yep. in the chat. So if you yeah, hit that, you there are five short that. questions. I think I put in five. Um, and I would be ever so grateful if you could fill that in for me. Um, for everyone else, let's take a maybe three minute break. Um, and we'll see you back here at 1.43.44 to talk about the nitty gritty on how to apply and who's eligible. So, And we'll see you, Nathan. You yes. That. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye bye. Good to see you, Alan. Catch you later. Yep. Good. Okay, so welcome back, everyone, except for Nathan. Can't see everyone's faces, so I'm hoping you're all coming back. Um, 
but thank you so much for taking the time to complete that. that that's really helpful for us. Well, we're back. Okay, so um, I'm going to hand over to Sam now, who's going to take us through uh, the piece around um, who's eligible to apply for the scholarship um, and just ask any questions as we go along again. And if anyone needs to leave along the way as well, um, because we're getting more into the nitty gritty of, of the application process, um, then thank you so much for your time and just feel free to go whenever you, you need to. So Sam, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, I think we've probably most of us seen oops, sorry, um, information on the website, but just worth going over um, the actual general eligibility requirements um, and the ones specific to each field. So uh, the age requirement is between 18 and 25 years old on the 30th of June this year. So um, we've actually raised the age uh, a year. So that's good news for some people. You, who you look very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good, that's good news. Um, some people, oh, um, <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yeah. So for just for a variety of reasons, um, we've added that extra year in. Uh, also, you have to be a, an Australian citizen or a permanent resident. Um, and you need to be able to, as discussed, leave uh, Australia for your scholarship by the end of the following year, so the end of 2024. Um, and you have to do two, uh, 20 days. So in your plan, have your 20-day um, work experience or scholarship-related activities. Also, so that... The actual um, categories, so the fields are obviously agriculture, trades and horticulture, and the requirements in each um, vary slightly in, in terms of qualification. So in agriculture, it's a, either have a certificate for or the equivalent BET qualification or about to complete that in, in um, either livestock management, cropping, mixed farming, or agribusiness. Agri it's getting sort of quite nitty gritty, but, and then horticulture, it's certificate three or a diploma, or likely to complete the equivalent in, within the year. Uh, and in trades, which we had subcategories of building and construction, transport and logistics, manufacturing and hospitality um, that's actually a certificate three in one of those relevant categories as well um, however we do have there is some leeway in the categories and if there is anyone in a trade who has wonderful um, sustainability ideas or uh, really wants to apply then we encourage you reply or, or discuss you know give us a call and and talk about um oh we've got a question there i think from melita go ahead melita yeah yeah hi everyone i'm from central regional tafe in western australia um hi. i just wanted to check with the the trades um with the the qualifications because they're all cert threes but the apprentices quite often like they have four years worth three years of TAFE study and then a year in the workshop or in the workplace. So what would be the minimum for that? If you know what I mean, like do they have to be a stage one, two, three or in their fourth um, year? In generally in their fourth year, I believe. Um, yep. So yeah, so they need the cert three um and then just see it does get a little complicated um with yeah with various trades Carmen do you have a uh, I think that? yeah I think the way we the way we run this is that people have to have a minimum qualification for the purpose of being able to maximize the scholarship opportunity so we want them to have the foundations of their profession laid. We also want to make sure that people have completed 
this education so that we don't interfere or interrupt their um, their education and training. Um, so we want, don't want people to leave with their certificate three, come to us and go throughout that year when they should be in their apprenticeship placement. So our minimum requirement is certificate three, but we want people to come to us at a time that they have completed their, their uh, vocational education and training, unless it is part of that training. So we, were, we have um, an agricultural college where their students come to us and do a scholarship as part of their qualification. So they come to us, I think, with a Cert three and complete the scholarship as part of their training within their college. That's mm -hmm. fine. But if it's not a built-in feature of a course, we like our scholars to come to us with their completed education and training so that the, the scholarship becomes something that they used to build on their training rather than something that disrupts their training. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Carmen. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know whether there's anything else I need to add on that. Um, basically, yeah, so if, if you are about to complete any of those um, qualifications and, and you're sort of on track to do so, there is a way for us to get your teacher to attest to, you know, your, your, your competence competency and your likelihood of completing so um and then once you get the qualification and have finished um you know and if it's an appropriate time to leave your training then you can then take up the scholarship so you would be encouraged to apply if you were about to you know complete your um apprenticeship or qualification um yeah if that makes sense there, there is a bit of wriggle room in there. So if we have somebody who's finished their certificate three, so has, to, has done all that, their TAFE training on campus, but then wants to go and do the scholarship during their apprenticeship with, their, with the blessing of their employer, that is also a possibility. So if there is any confusion around it, please send people to us to just raise it with us and we can have a, we can have a chat about it. What's important to us is that they have a solid foundation of learning and training that they bring with us, and also that they do the scholarship at a time that it supports their um, training and education rather than becomes a disruptor to it. Yep, that's great. Thank you. So I think I've covered eligibility. Um, did you want to talk Can about... Can I just ask one question on that? Yep, so sure. If there was a, a, a person uh, who's just who has finished his apprenticeship, I'm thinking of someone in particular, and they are actually, uh, they came out of that as a qualified carpenter, and now they're thinking about uh, going in and doing a, a Cert 3 in landscaping and horticulture, um, would he be el eligible to apply? Under the, you know, like he's done, he's already finished his apprenticeship and, and is qualified, yet he's going in and doing horticulture now because he wants to become a landscaper could he apply and in, in that situation um it depends on what category they want to apply under they could certainly apply as a carpenter with the purpose of going overseas and learning about landscaping and using their skill in landscaping yeah. they wouldn't be able to apply as a horticulturist because they don't have the qualification yet right but they certainly can apply with their carpentry background if they still intend to use it as such. And if they're still under 25. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. But I get what you're saying, Ellen, and we have had that in the past. If people have applied with one thing to transition into another, that yeah. does happen. And yeah. um, we don't discourage it as long as there is, you know, purpose in the learning. So we don't want somebody to apply who is, say, an electrician, but actually ultimately wants to go to university and become an engineer, we yeah. want it to still be relevant to VET careers. Yeah. So we well, don't the thing with work. carpentry does work with landscaping. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah. this is where he's kind of, he's leaning towards now. Yeah. Yes. So if that's, yes. Yeah, so if to go to landscape construction, I think that's the certificate, isn't it? Yeah. 
landscape construction. Yes, so that, that's a possibility. We have in the past awarded a landscape construction professional a horticulture scholarship because that's what he was interested in. And that's where he wanted to work. He wanted to work more in gardening than in earth moving. Yeah. So it, yes, those, those, those things are all possible and we can, we can look at them um, when someone comes to us. So we do have this eligibility criteria for specific reasons, but yeah. our purpose is to support the right people on the, on the path that we are here to support. So we have some regular room. All right, cool, cool. No, I know he's just a, he's just such an enthusiast on plants, even though he started life as a carpenter and uh, he now wants to kind of go across. So, uh, and that's what he wants to, uh, you know, to end up uh, achieving type of thing uh, as a landscape. Could combine both, that's cool. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. and great for our industry. Great for our yeah. industry. So, yeah, oh, I'll pass it on. Yeah, mm -hmm. Excellent. Are there any other questions on eligibility? By all means, get in touch if you if there's any sort of grey areas where you want to, um, yeah, you're not sure, obviously, give us a call or, yeah, we're happy to talk about it. So, Great, thanks, Sam. Um, so I think we've covered off most things. We've covered off the, the assessment piece first and the purpose of the program, the background of the program, the structure and design of the program, uh, who can apply. Is there... Are there any other questions that people have that you'd like us to answer? I'm just aware of the time as well, so people will need to go. But any other questions that you'd like us to discuss now? Melita. Yeah, hi. Um, I had a couple of colleagues that were supposed to join as well. One of the things, um, well, they couldn't make it. So one of the things that we would kind of wanted to know from um, for us is like what kind of, so I think we would definitely have some students that might be interested in applying for something like that. So we kind of wanted to know what, what, how you would like us to promote it, like um, resources and, and stuff like that, that you could provide us to, to give out to our students. Right. So we, we have sent emails through with a whole lot of um, information about the about the scholarship. So if you haven't got that, we'll make sure that you get it. Yeah. No, so, I have got some of that, but I thought more um, in depth um, on our website or anything like that, if that was something that you wanted us to do. Oh, OK. It would be great if you could refer to us on your website can, and link it through to our website. That would be that would be cool. All the information about the scholarships are on our website, obviously. So um yeah, we just encourage you to to make that available to people and so that they yep. know where to go and look look for it. And of course, if you want to let them, if anyone wants to ring us and just have a chat about it, they're more than welcome to do that as well. Yep, fantastic. And Melita, do you have the the link to all the resources, like the posters and the social posts? And yeah, I do have that. I've got I've I've got everything open at the moment. So. Yeah, we just thought if there was something more that we could do as well to, to get the word out, then yeah, we'd be happy to help. Oh, that, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. So yes, however many, uh, you know, what you can do, we appreciate because we want to mm -hmm. get the opportunity out to as many young people as we can. And we've never had a scholar from WA, so we'd love to. We, we, oh, okay. Yeah, happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Too. <laughs> yeah, we have. We have had a couple. We yeah. have. We have one, not that I know of. So. <laughs> yeah, so it's 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 a wonderful thing for you to offer, and we really hope that we'll see WA coming through strongly in the applications this round. So I really, really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if there aren't any more questions on what we've covered already i'll just say a couple of things about how to apply and the application um, and how to put in an application um, so it's all on the website in a form in the first round we don't ask for any supporting evidence so nobody needs to worry that by the 12th of um, june they will have to have passports birth certificates um, qualification scan to upload we're not asking for any of that in the first round the first round is only 
answering the five questions, which are about passion for sustainability, passion for the industry, um, a little bit of an insight into what people know about the global happenings in their industry, things that they've seen in other countries, things that they've read about or seen. Um, so we just want to gauge whether the person applying is really keen on what they do, do love what they do, do what they love and want to do more of it in a global picture. So that's what those five questions are here to capture. It's mostly about passion. So we encourage people to speak from the heart, share what they love with us so that we can get an idea whether they are the right kind of fit. There are two ways to answer these questions. The form has boxes where people can write, but there's also the opportunity to record a video or submit some photos. So what's required for that is just to upload it into the cloud, into whatever app is shareable, and then put the link into that box. So we encourage video, we encourage photos, we encourage whatever people feel like captures best who they are and what they want to bring to the program. Then this, then um, that can all be prepared up front. So be encouraged to do that. Just write the questions out or record it all, get it all ready, and then copy and paste it into the form. Everybody can only submit one form. So best to prepare and then do it all when it's ready and submit that. Then just on that, Carmen, yeah. just, the questions are actually on the website as well. So you haven't got to go into the form just to get the questions. You can just see them on the mm -hmm. website. So you can prepare from that first, like Carmen was saying. Yeah, that's correct. And one tip I can give is that this cohort of scholars that got given the, uh, um, the scholarships in the last year, that was 2022, what's on the website about them in the current scholars section, that text that you see with their photos is actually their application answers. Unless they've gone already and we have a report for them, that's what they've submitted and that's what was successful. So if you want to know what other people have done, have a look at the profiles of our scholars from 2022. Um, are there any questions around that piece? Okay, then once you've submitted the form, what happens next is that it will get um, looked at by Sam to check whether everything, whether the person is eligible. So we'll just make a, do a first check on have they got, uh, have they answered all the questions? Are they Australian citizens? So you have to enter, enter some of your data, where you live, where you're from, and so on. Um, so they make sure, Sam makes sure that that according to what they filled in, they're eligible. And then Sam will start asking for the supporting evidence. So everybody will have about, about two weeks to submit their, um, their information. And then once we have made sure that everybody who applied, who we think was eligible, actually is eligible, then these documents, not, not the documents, sorry, then these answers go to the panel for assessment. None of the personal information goes, just the answers. And if you applied for horticulture, your application questions will go with everybody else's from horticulture to that horticulture pool of assessors. So they will look at each one of them, but non-identified. So there'll be no names, no ages, no locations where this came from. And the same goes for the other categories. And once the panel has decided, what they you know what they, they don't decide actually they read through it and they give us their feedback on each application and then we ask them for their top three so that then comes back to us from each of the individual assessors and then it's back to bbm to look at what we have and who fits best with the program then we will notify the scholars who of oh, the people we would like to offer a scholarship to with the conditions of the scholarship, like, you know, you have to travel before the 31st of December next year. And the scholar has the opportunity to look at all those terms and conditions, and then we invite them to accept it 
And once the scholarship is accepted, we have an award ceremony where the scholars receive their certificate. And from there, we roll into our program. Thanks, Carmen. Does anyone have any questions about that? Was that a hand? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Riddle Scrake. Oh, we can't hear you. If we apply and are unsuccessful, can we apply next year? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> as long as you remain under the age of 26, on the 30th of June that year, you can reapply. And we have had, we currently have a scholar in Sweden at the moment who applied one year and was highly commended and reapplied and got the scholarship on the second attempt. Great, any other questions? No, well, we're just about five minutes over time now. So we've done pretty well to get through all of that in in an hour. So we, if there's no more questions, then we might might leave it there. Thank you, Carmen and Sam, for all of that. And, um, and thank you for everyone who's still with us uh, for your time. We really appreciate it. If you have any questions at all, you think of something afterwards, just feel free to reach out to any one of us and we're happy to help. And we look forward to looking at all your applications.